Peter, thank you for reminding us that indeed the boat is departing from the other side, and yet so much of John is still right here with us. I'm Tom Rossiello, the affiliate minister of this Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. It is indeed my privilege to officiate this afternoon, and it was also my privilege to know John as a good friend over the past many years. On behalf of John's wife, Wendy, and his daughter, Melinda, and all John's family and close friends, I welcome you to this gathering. As a symbol, symbolic way of expressing it, we all know that we pass our light from one generation to the next. I would like to invite John, daughter Melinda to come up now and light our candle. We light a flame in honor and in celebration of the life and living of John Siebert. The light that was his life continues to shine, though it be from a distant shore. In lighting this flame, we acknowledge that a spark of his life is still present with us, especially in this service today. The preciousness of his life still casts about us its radiance. In memory, we carry his flame in our hearts. John was a smart and talented person, as you know. But he was not one to blow his own horn very much. But certainly he did let his light shine in the world in so many ways. He really believed that when people let their light shine, they could do amazing things. So it's no surprise that time and again he told me how he loved singing the hymn, This Little Light of Mine. In his words, and these words I best remember them, see if they sound true to you, Hey man, this one really gets to the point. <laughs> he loved it. When people really sang it out and when they clapped their hands. So I invite you to please rise and do just that. It's found in number 118 in the hymnal, but I bet most of you know the words, so you can probably take a quick look, put it down, and then clap it. All of us musicians here, please help lead us so we can really make this a message for John. that light that still casts about us its radiance. That light that lives on in so many ways here in this community, back in the States, and in so many hearts. Yet at the same time, of course, we mourn the passing of one whom we've known and cherished. We know none of us escaped the hurt of losing one we love. At those times when we face death, we all need the comfort and support and understanding of others. Just being together takes away some of the loneliness and provides its measure of comfort. We too find comfort in all that remains with us of John. The memories that are so alive, 
his spirit, his caring. Those memories we share especially today and we carry with us every day. The part of John's life which death can never take away. We come from different traditions with different beliefs, but we come together today. Thornton Wilder once put it this way, there is a land of the living and a land of the dead, and the bridge is love. So together we make this hour love's hour, and this simple service loves confessional. For it's simply love's tribute that we bring to offer here today. Together we'll give thanks for a life well lived, a life of both good times and some struggles, not a perfect life, or who among us could make such a claim, but a life of real talent and courage and character and principle, with real creative times and fun times and learning times and caring times shared with many. We come to express our gratitude for the days and years we were able to be with John. And by remembering the best of his life, by recalling some of his finest qualities, by honoring the principles and values and dreams that guided him, John's enduring nobility flows into us that we may be more noble in the days ahead. As you'll hear today, John had many passions. And as Wendy reminded me, music was number one. Not just as a musician himself, or as a music lover, but really more as a musicologist. That is one who studied and engaged with the music. Ask John who wrote a song, or what guitarist played it, or what album it was on, and that incredible memory of his produced the answer. John got so excited about music of all kinds, not just rock or country or folk or jazz or bluegrass, the music of his work life, but world music and classical music too. One of his sister-in-laws remembered his collection of over 3,000 records. And she noted that with all that great collection, when she walked into his office, he was playing, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. <laughs> In all seriousness, John was fascinated and moved by all kinds of music. How many times did you hear John say after someone performed some music, wasn't that great, man? I know that music filled John's soul, and it will fill this service. This service to today will be as much music as talking. All the music you'll hear today is music that John loved. But Wendy knew that there were two beautiful pieces that John wanted in this service. One, the Ashokan Farewell, and the other, the most very beautiful Adagio movement that you'll now hear performed. <laughs>
sometimes a poem really captures who a person is. Wendy and I both think that this one captures John, expressing exactly what his wishes were. It's from Into the Sunset by J. Hall Young. <clears throat> Let me die working, still tackling plans unfinished, tasks undone. Clean to its end, swift may my race be run. No laggard step, no faltering, no shirking. Let me die working. Let me die thinking. Let me bear forth with an open mind, fresh sense to unfold, new truths to find, my soul undimmed, alert, no question blinking. Let me die thinking. Let me die giving the substance of life for life's enriching, time, things, and self on heaven converging. No selfish thought, loving, redeeming, living. Let me die, give it. I believe John left this world very much the way he wanted to. During the last days of Farley Wheelwright's life, when John would often visit him, and Farley, who was quite ready to go quite a time before he did pass, after John visited one day, he said to me, in his rather direct and abrupt way, <laughs> when my time comes, I hope I just drop. And that's pretty much what happened. You know, although the words of the poet can capture so much for us, Sometimes the simple lyrics and tune of a country music or gospel song can speak to us in ways perhaps even deeper. Mark and Catherine will now sing the song Wide River to Cross by Levin Helms as a tribute to John. Up a long, long road Still are miles to go tracks I made across the memories my heart can recall. But I'm still a refugee. Won't you share a prayer for me? Cause sometimes my heart must fall. I come along John was born in Harrisburg, Ohio, the second of six children. He graduated from Bowling Green University in Ohio with a degree in journalism. He was drafted into the Army in 1965, and he served as an information officer, as Wendy described to me, think radar and mash. <laughs> After his time in the Army, he did some journalism and photography and he got a job in advertising in Massachusetts. Soon after he got that job, he was snowed in in a blizzard in Worcester, Massachusetts for two weeks. He had two brothers that lived in Santa Cruz, California, so he decided to move to California, and soon John moved to San Francisco. It was 1969. He worked selling photography equipment at Brooks Camera. Met a lot of people, started taking photographs, and. His work was noticed. He sold photos to local newspapers and started freelance 
with the GPI, Guitar Player Magazine. Before too long, his talent was recognized there, and he joined the permanent staff of Guitar Player as a photographer, and then also as editor and editor. He met Wendy in 1978, and later they had a sort of more appropriate and I'd say typical meeting for the profession they were in. They met at a Bruce Springsteen concert again in 1979, and that's when things started going. They were married in 1980, and John passed away four days shy of their 40th anniversary. In 1982, Linda was born. Soon they bought a house in San Francisco, and John became a great dad. But we'll let Melinda tell you about that. Hi, guys. Hi. Uh, Melinda, you can probably tell. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, of course, I'm really touched today by seeing all the love and support for my dad. Um, but if I'm being honest, I'm not surprised, because as you guys all know, my dad was not somebody who lacked for personality or <laughs> zest for life. <laughs> and he was nothing if not very, very memorable and lovable. Um, however, having a somewhat unique perspective, I thought I would share a little bit about what it was like to know John Siebert as a pet. I'm an only child, and my dad worked from home for the majority of my childhood, so we were kind of uniquely close. And he, he frequently took me to work with him during my baby and toddler years. So I have actually a lot of memories of running around the guitar player offices and like busting into people's meetings and stuff like that. <laughs> and I also used to accompany him on photo shoots in a little baby backpack. And I've met, oh yeah, and I've met a lot of people as an adult who when they've been introduced to me have said, oh, I remember you when you were just a baby in your dad's backpack. And this includes like world-class musicians and things like that. <laughs> Uh, because he frequently worked from home, he also did a lot of the at-home parent duties during my school years. So he dropped me off at school, he packed my lunches, he set my bus money out on the counter, he knocked on my door to make sure I was awake in the morning, and I always said yes, even though I was still under the covers. Uh, he Also, when I was a kid, I had this idea that I couldn't get up on Christmas Day. I had to wait for them to come wake me up, probably because I didn't have any siblings to be a bad influence on me. So what I would do is I would get up and I would sneak into the living room and I would peek at the present and then I would sneak back to my room and go back to sleep. And then one year my dad came in at like, I don't know, eight or nine in the morning and he said, I can't believe I have to wake my own kid up on Christmas. <laughs> We shared a lifelong love of words and reading, and he took me to get my first library card, something I still uh, use a lot to this day. I, I know that my lack of interest in playing basketball or learning to play any musical instruments was a disappointment for him. He would never admit it, because you know, he's a good dad. Uh, but he did wholeheartedly embrace whatever I actually was interested in, so I decided to play soccer my junior year of high school, and suddenly my dad was watching the World Cup. Uh, when I joined high school drama, he came to every single one of my plays with my mom, and I'm really touched to hear the Thornton Wilder quote, because I actually was in our town my senior year of high school, and I played the narrator. Uh, when I took an interest in film history, we rented dozens of movies from the AFI 100 list and watched them together. Uh, when I started volunteering and then working at the zoo, he very proudly told everyone about my work. I'm pretty convinced that for the first 10 years I worked at the zoo, he didn't quite know what my job was, other than she works at the zoo, but that did not mean that he was any less proud of me for it. <laughs> and he always wanted to talk to me about news articles he'd seen about animals and zoos and things like that, was always really excited when something was going on in the news to call me up and talk to me about it. Um, and I have to say, a lot of people have come up to me today and in the last couple of weeks and who have said, oh, you know, your dad, he was so proud of you. And the truth is, you know, I knew it. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was never stingy with his praise or his love, ever. So I, I never doubted that at all. Um, even after I'd grown up and I'd started a really, really busy adult life, um, he always had time for a chat. He was always asking about what I was up to, how things were going. Uh, he wanted to know where I was traveling next and would ask me all about that place. And I could just always count on calling up my parents' number and I would hear my dad's, you know, hey kiddo, and his bright voice right on the other end as a greeting. Uh, I am my parents' only child, but my dad had some strong dad energy that could not be contained to only me. <laughs> So he had a really strong relationship with our close family friend, Josh, that predated both me and my mom in his life and that persisted um, right up until the end. He made time for weekend visits with my cousin Ace, who had lost his own dad when he was just a kid. 
And when my best friend from high school found out that my dad had passed, she called me up and she wanted to talk to me. And she reminded me about the time that she was over at our house when um, it was her birthday and we made a frozen pizza and then we put a candle in the frozen pizza and my dad played happy birthday to her on the mandolin. <laughs> and um, she didn't have a father figure in her own life and she just wanted me to know that being embraced into our family in that way had really meant a lot to her. Um, You know, imagining a world without my dad is really hard because, as you know, he was such a big presence, right? Like, even when he's not there, he's there. You feel him, right? He's, he's somebody you don't forget and you always know is around. And, you know, I'm almost 38, so that's a long time that I've really had him in my life. And even just deciding what to say today was difficult because there's so many years of memories and stories and things like that. And all this week, it's like I still keep expecting him to just walk through the door, you know? Um, what it really comes down to is just that um, I will miss him. Um, I'm going to miss our hour-long chats where he would always tell me all about the goings-on in San Miguel and whatever latest party or benefit concert he was planning. Uh, I'm going to miss his annual post on Facebook on my wedding anniversary, reminiscing about walking me down the aisle. I'll miss hearing him pluck away at his mandolin in his office. I will even sort of a little bit miss debating the Democratic primaries with him. <laughs> <laughs> like a little bit, y'all know how we got, right? <laughs> We're in London, New Hampshire, so he's stoked right now, so. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I know that right now he's probably up at some awesome party with a bunch of good friends, plucking away, having a good time, and when the day comes that we're going to meet on the other side, he'll be there, and he'll have his black cap on, and he'll have a big old smile underneath his mustache, and he'll have his arms up stretched for a hug, and he'll be saying, hey, you know. As I already said, John was really not one to blow his own horn, so I think many of us are rather surprised to know really what a star he was. He photographed the world's greatest musicians in rock, folk, bluegrass, and other genres. Look, look back at this room to just a few of his works. Who do you see back there? I see Ray Charles, B.B. King, Eric Clapton, Pete Seeger, and a lot more. By the way, be sure to take a walk around that corner after the service and look at what's just a small sample of John's work. John knew how to capture the greats. I think when you look at those photos, you can actually feel the music in those photos. His photos not only grace the cover and pages of Guitar Magazine, but many related magazines, even the cover of Rolling Stone. Linda, Wendy's sister, recalls that their mom used to take out the magazines with John photos on the cover and inside and show them to the neighbors to demonstrate how famous her son-in-law was. <laughs> and when his photo was on the cover of Rolling Stone, the family had to buy her five copies so she could have enough to really show off her pride in John. The people John photographed, the people he who worked with John, many of them big names in the music industry, in film, in media, in photography, are uniform in their praise, not just for his work, but also for who he was as a professional person. His friend and co-worker Dan Fort said this about John's death. This is an incalculable loss, both personally and professionally, for the music community around the world. With decades as staff photographer for Guitar Player Magazine, where he was also assistant editor, and its sister magazines, Keyboard and Frets. He had more photographs of guitarists, all of the highest quality, than any other photographer on earth. And tons of pics of other musicians and people as well. Also, an excellent interviewer and writer. He was the reason I got my first freelance article published in Guitar Player, and we later worked on many projects together. He was warm, fun, intelligent, caring, and generous to a fault. He was so passionate about everything. So long, John. There will never be another like you. And Monroe Grisman, son of John's friend David Grisman, 
probably the greatest mandolin player in the world, writes, I was truly shocked and saddened to hear the passing of John Seaver. John was a dear friend of our family. I can't remember a time when John was not at one of Dad's shows. He was always the nicest guy and very inquisitive and supportive of whatever I was doing. I considered him among the many uncles I grew up surrounded by. He was one of the all-time great Bay Area photographers of music. I remember him giving me a fantastic photo of Eddie Van Halen when I was in the eighth grade, which became my prized possession and hung on my wall. He single-handedly captured nearly every phase of my father's great career. He, of course, also captured so many other legends, heroes of rock, blues, jazz, etc. I did not realize the magnitude of his work till later in life. I will really miss you, John. Thank you for all you gave us in this world. Rest in peace, my friend. The accolades from these renowned folks just kept coming in. Dan Gantz, longtime friend, musician, and radio personality, wrote at the time that he and John jointly interviewed Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir. Julie Young, daughter of Jesse Colin Young, you remember the Young Bloods and Jefferson Starship, wrote, John was a phenomenal photographer, iconic to say the least, and gracious and loving as a human being. Take a look at John's Facebook page if you can. It just goes on and on, and they all agree. He was a great talent, tops in his field, and his work lives on not only as an incredible record of the time and music, but as a standard of excellence in photography. You know, here at the UU Fellowship, one way John was involved was on our social justice, social justice committee. You couldn't have a conversation with John without experiencing his passion for justice and the issues of the time. John could get really fired up about those <laughs> justice issues, in case you didn't perceive that. One of Wendy's sisters recalls that before going to visit with them, there would be a discussion banning certain political <laughs> topics being discussed during the visit. But you know, John didn't just do the talk. He walked the walk. John knew what our own Theodore Parker said nearly 200 years ago, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, or maybe John bent it towards justice. <laughs> Those of you who do social justice work know that one can very easily get burnt out meeting the challenges of injustice, especially injustice that seems to go on and on for a long time. One can become discouraged, but when John had a cause, he stuck with it. Many of us over the years, over many years, heard about this prisoner who John worked so hard to help get justice, Boston Woodward. I want to share, you, share with you some of Boston's words. I can't believe John passed on. Him and I would talk two, sometimes three times a week on Facebook video. I was probably a pain in his butt, but he gave me all the time I wanted anyway to rant on about whatever I could come up with. I just loved talking to him. I would walk away from our conversations feeling good for the rest of the day. I can't think of anyone else that could do that for me. While I was in prison, John would encourage me, no matter what I was doing, music, writing, art, you name it, and John always provided me with sound advice. There were times when I just wanted to give up, and John said, that was weak, or he'd say, stop talking foolish, Boston. He did that for me. He did that not because he felt sorry for me, he did it because he wanted to help me. When I decided to begin writing about some of the abuses and deplorable living conditions inside, he told me to be careful, but to do what I felt was right. 
When I needed to talk, he'd let me call. When I was having a bad day, feeling like crap, I would get mail from John. Magazines, photos, letters, flyers, cards, and more. When prison guards were threatening me, breaking and destroying my personal property, John suggested I try to get the attention of, attorney, of an attorney. And I did just that. And in 1995, attorney David Newdark began putting a lawsuit together for me. John made dozens of phone calls relating to that. He wrote letters and got as many people as he could to shed some light on my situation. I couldn't believe that someone would go above and beyond to do something like that for me. I was in prison. People don't do things like that for you here. John did. I believe his actions may have literally saved me from something more serious that could have happened and does happen often behind prison walls. John would tell me stories about some of the events and programs he was involved in with the Unitarian Universalists. When I asked him about the UUs, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was a UU and didn't know it. <laughs> I eventually became a UU because I did UU things and it felt good to me. I hope to get more involved with them. John did something for me that no one had ever done before. He made me feel like a normal person. I was the poster child for the irretrievable miscreant, if there ever was one. I would never listen to anyone. I would always do what I wanted to do, which was everything bad. But I got involved with so many projects in prison, I didn't have time for bad behavior because I finally had someone in my life that I wanted to be like. John trusted me. No one has ever done that. John believed in me. No one has ever done that. John encouraged me. No one has ever done that. But what John did big time was inspire me by example. I could go on forever. This is a void that is impossible to fill. I just hope the hurt goes away sometime. I just recently applied for a passport so I could go to San Miguel Allende this spring or this summer. I gave John my word I was going there, so I still plan to do it. I want to see what John has been telling me about, and I want to meet all of you, John's friends, though I feel like I already know. John was truly a special human being, and I honestly did love him as if he was my brother. He'll be sorely missed. I think we all better get ready to greet Boston when he arrives. <laughs> well, in 2003, when John and Wendy came to San Miguel, John began looking out for what was here. You know, we had that big personality. One of his family described it as a type A plus personality. <laughs> so he began checking out things in town. He was looking for where he could help and where he would find his kind of community. He found the musicians and loved them and supported them and played his mandolin with them. He found the writers, the journalists, the photographers. He helped them, self-published them, or connected them with others. He found the causes he believed in and the people who needed him, and he was there for them. He found the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and are we ever grateful that he did. He was always enthusiastic and bigger than life in his personality, and it filled this room every week. He was always right there. And frankly, right now, it's a bit jolting for me to turn to my left and not see him. He hardly ever missed a service. His presence still looms large in this room and in this community. He served this congregation with his time, his talents, and his love, especially his love of music. He was president, board member on the Social Action Committee, on the Sunday Service Committee. And every week, for years, year after year, he used to write 
that wonderful article for Atencion. What dedication. Week 52 weeks a year to do that. And for many years now, he's arranged for guest musicians to enrich our service. I wish I could have asked all of them to play for this service, but if we did, we would be here for a week. <laughs> John loved all kinds of music, and he truly loved being able to support and promote local musicians from the Mexican community. One of the people he often invited to share her music with us was Yuraymond Jacoby. And today, she, sort of representing all those other musicians, is going to perform a song of tribute to John. share so many more stories, so many more songs, and I'm sure each one of you has one. I hope at the reception which follows over here to my right, you'll share them with John's family and with each other. But I think the words from Diane Arkeesian do a pretty good job of summing up John, and I'd like to share them. John was one of the best people I've ever known, kind and generous and stimulating. He was a special friend, a buddy, as well as a mentor. I'll miss his lively Sunday group lunch conversations covering politics, Trumpism, and the state of the world. I miss him as I would a brother. He always had my back. I'm sad for myself that he is no longer on the same plane. John was one of the great homo sapiens in my book, he was an original. I think these words also from John Hayes' home capture our thoughts at this time. Death this year has taken a man whose kind we shall not see again. Pride and skill and friendliness, warmth and wisdom and delight are shining still, but shining less and clouded to the common sight. Time will show him clear again, and time will give us other men with names to write in burning gold when they are great and we are old. But he was royal hearted, rare, memory keeps with loving care, deeds he did and tales he told, but living men are hard to spare. So now to a husband and a father, a relative and a friend we bid farewell. Loved you were, John, and loved you will continue to be, for we know that love is the only thing stronger than death. So in words, and now in music, we bid farewell. So long, John.
about something I had collected for a guitar magazine, and that's where I met him. He later came to Mexico with me when I was making guitars in Toracho, Michoacan, and did an article. And we stopped in Zamora at a hotel. And I said, John, I'll teach you about traveling. When they asked about the room, can I then see it? <laughs> <laughs> so the man told, the little young man said, it's this much, I said. John, he said, oh, can we see it? So he took us to the room, which was fine. And he went, one minute. And he went and came back with an orange crate and a cushion. <laughs> and put it at the end of the bed. Now, <laughs> for those of you who didn't know John, he was quite tall. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, Mark, I think I'm going to like Mexico. <laughs> shared a lot of interest in roots music and a lot of other things. And uh, the song I learned from a great musician from Harlem, New York, the Reverend Gary Davis. He became a Christian minister and also sang spiritual songs and music. That I feel just like going on. Yeah, I feel just like going on. I done come this far. I didn't find no fault. Well, I feel, you know, I feel. Yeah, I feel, I feel just like going on. Now I'm singing just to go right on. Yeah, I'm singing just to go right on. I done come this far. I didn't find no fault. Well, I feel, you know I feel, yeah, I feel, I feel just like going on, on and on, on and on, yeah, I feel, I feel just like going on. I done come this far. I didn't find no fault. Well, feel. You know I feel. Yeah, yeah. I feel just like going on. Well, shake a glad hand. Just to go right on. You shake a glad hand just to go right on. I done come this far. I didn't find no fault. Well, I feel, you know I feel. Yeah, I feel, I feel just like going on. Just like going on. And now John's old band, the, the High Desert Rangers, are going to come back together for today to lead us in a good old country hymn, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? So would they all come on up while they're doing it? I also want to invite all the other musicians in.
for this fellow you are caring but I hate to see him go surpasses all our human understanding and in which John now rests dwell in our hearts and in our minds 
this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. keeps us breathing Isn't it love that we're brought here for Wasn't that love that we were feeling Yes it was Deep, deep in our soul Deeper than we know Keeping me holding out for you There was never any question Jameson's old bush mills, 
or Trotsky on the rocks, the Fenian at the barricade, the batter in the box, a song for every season, a smile for every fight, comedians and angels, I miss my friends tonight. When Dave was in his glory, singing Brecht and Vile, the Clancy's haul that shanty out and gave us Patty Doyle. The Mets were either best or worst, and Marx was wrong or right. Comedians and angels, I miss my friends tonight. I wonder where they are now, they could be anywhere. In hell or California, or back in Sheridan Square. They left us where they left us, so we turn out the light. Comedians and angels, I miss my friends tonight. Dave's drained a parting glass then and sailed out to sea. And what a crew of rogues they made in gleeful anarchy. They sang to the horizon a song no pen could write. Comedians and angels, I miss my friends tonight. They sang to the horizon a song no pen could write. Comedians and angels, I miss my friends tonight. I like singing that song. I hadn't sung it in much too, much too long. You shall have a melancholy lunch. You've earned your chicken. I claim my reward.